2 Peter chapter 2, um, starting at verse 13 and reading through to the end of the chapter. Now I say pick up where we left off before. Uh, in many of our modern English verse, versions uh, of the Bible, um, uh, chapter 12 and chapter 13 are a continuation, chapter 13, or sorry, verse 13 is a continuation of uh, verse 12. It is, it is, there is no full stop at the end of verse 12. And it's all part of that one sentence. The NIV, in their wisdom, have chosen to break here and, in fact, put a paragraph in. Now, we have to remember that paragraphs in the Bible are uh, they're, they're artificial. Um, verses are artificial. Chapters are artificial. There was none of that. So there's you know, a bit of uh, a guesswork and judgment as to where to break things. Now, say, with the NIV in their wisdom, uh, they've decided to, to put a break here. Um, uh, and uh, I'm not going to pit my wisdom against theirs except to say that there must be a reason why all the others didn't. Um, and uh, I, I must admit, I, I, looking at it more closely this week, I tend to think that perhaps it ought to be a continuation and certainly not a paragraph um, change. Um, uh, not until the, the, uh, the end of that first sentence in verse 13. But we'll pick it up as it is and, uh, and, and we'll read it. Um, from verse 13 to the end. 2 Peter 2. He's talking about false teachers in the church, okay? So they, the false teachers, will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. Their idea of pleasure is to carouse in broad daylight. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their pleasures while they feast with you. With eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. They seduce the unstable and are experts in greed and a cursed brood. They have left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, son of Beor, who loved the wages of wickedness, but he was rebuked for his wrongdoing by a donkey, a beast without speech who spoke with a man's voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These men are springs without water, mists driven by the storm. Blackest darkness is reserved for them, for they mouth empty, boastful words, and by appealing to the lustful desires of the sinful human nature, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, while they themselves are slaves of depravity. For a man is a slave to whatever has mastered him. And if they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, and are again entangled in it uh, and overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then to turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Of them the proverbs are true. A dog returns to its vomit and a sow that washes goes back to her wallowing in the mud. <clears throat> well, may God bless his word to us today. Um, it's a bit of a, uh, you know, a, a gloomy word, isn't it, today, really? Um, not exactly the most uplifting passage that you will ever read in Scripture. Um, but, uh, you know, these things have to be dealt with, particularly when, as we often do, is we, we kind of work through um, a book of the Bible or a section of the Bible. And one of the great things about that is that, that no stone should be left unturned. And uh, we end up, uh, you know, having to deal with things, even though we'd rather skip over them. Um, so we don't want to skip over uh, this today. Uh, and last time, two weeks ago, uh, when we were looking at this, we were looking at, uh, again, at the false prophets. <clears throat> and we, re we realized there that, uh, that what the false prophets tell us does not add up. It does not add up. It does not stack up. And when we have a knowledge, a good, sound knowledge of the Word of God, 
you can start to hear what is wrong with a false teacher. Uh, things they start to say and, and do as well. I mean, it's much more than just what comes out of their, their lips. Um, it, you know, it, it's also about who they are, their personality, their character, their behavior. All of these kind of things should start to send alarm bells ringing up in us when things are not right. And that is what Peter is saying uh, to these people now. Remember that these uh, were people who lived in Rome, who got scattered um, over to uh, Turkey. Um, so they're running away from a great persecution that has broken out against the church. Peter is no longer with them to protect them, but he is well aware of the wolves that are out there who would seek to devour, and it would seem that reports are already getting back to Peter of the kind of people uh, that, that are living in this Asia Minor area where they've gone to. And he wants to protect uh, his old flock, uh, and he's doing everything that he can in order to do so. Now, while they were all living in Rome and Peter was overseeing the church in Rome at the time, uh, it was very easy for Peter to, to deal head on with the errors that were coming into the church, even though errors did indeed still come in and, and they had to be dealt with. But, but now, he says, you're on your own. You, you've, you, you've had to scatter and you are susceptible to danger. So, you know, I need you to understand the dangers that are out there so that you can avoid them. Um, and also a warning, I think, to anybody who was seduced by the way of the false teachers. And he says, you know, don't go down that route. It's a dangerous one. And in this second half of this chapter, you know, the whole chapter is dealing with this, but in this second half, it seems to me that one of the, uh, the things that Peter is really bringing out that seems to come out to me anyway is the price for misleading. And it is indeed a very heavy price for misleading God's people or any people, uh, but in the name of God for misleading people. Um, he says there is a heavy price. Now, the Bible has always dealt severely with those who misrepresent God. Uh, in the Old Testament, there were the false prophets, and chapter 2 opens up with a parallel. And uh, uh, so uh, in chapter 2, he starts by saying, but there were also false prophets among the people. So he says there were some good uh, prophets uh, who gave us some wonderful prophecies in Scripture. Uh, and then he goes on to say, but there were also false prophets. And he says, just as that was so back then in what we would now call Old Testament times. He says, today, in what we would now call New Testament times, he says there are some who are good, honest, um, dedicated uh, teachers of the word of God, and there are some who are false teachers of the word. And he begins to build up a profile of what a false teacher looks like so that we can see them and that we are not... Uh, um, uh, uh, mistaken ourselves, led astray, decepted, um, and uh, you know, and all that comes with that. And so, uh, what he's basically said that um, uh, in in the, the first half of the chapter, just as a, a quick recap on that, he says that there are uh, many false teachers who are coming into the church. Uh, he says these false teachers um, have got nothing but condemnation and destruction coming their way. He says, let's not make any mistakes about that. He says, there, there's big trouble coming for misleading people. The Bible takes that very seriously. God takes it very, very seriously indeed. And he says, let me give you some examples to just prove how big the destruction is. And in verse 4, he says, if God did not spare angels when they sinned, he says, God didn't even spare the angels, those heavenly beings, when they sinned and turned against him. But he cast them out, some of them into dungeons waiting for their ultimate day of judgment to come. He says, if he did not spare Sodom and Gomorrah, if he did not spare, you know, all of these um, uh, people in the past that sinned, 
he says, then make no mistake, he is not going to spare the false teachers today. He's put them into the same category as the people in Sodom and Gomorrah, the same category as the angels who fell and turned against God, as the devil himself. He says, that's how serious God takes this. But equally, he says, if he knows how to punish the unrighteous, then he also knows how to save the righteous. And he says, make no mistake about that, that, that if we are uh, following the Lord, um, and let's be honest, we all make mistakes, we don't get everything right all of the time, but if we, with a completely upright and honest heart, seek to follow him and to serve him, he says, he knows how to save you. He knows how to save you. One of the questions that rises from this is why is it, why is it that the Bible takes such a strong line against those who would deceive in the word and the message of the Lord? And the answer is because it's a matter of life and death. We take very seriously today those who do not uh, take responsibility for the lives of others when they could do. There are people today who have had to face the justice system because they did nothing in a situation where they could have done something. People who did not act in order to save others. So it's not just a case of willfully harming somebody else, but it's actually for those who didn't do something good when they could have done it. And that's a great picture of how we as Christians are meant to be, that we are actually meant to do only what is good, only what is, is helpful, only what builds up the church, only what helps others towards God. And if we deliberately start misleading, misguiding, for whatever reason that might be, but if we start deliberately doing that, the Lord says, I take a very dim view of that because you are playing with somebody's eternal future. There will be many people, many people who could well have been in heaven, in glory, right at this very moment, who I believe are not because of people who deceived them and led them astray in many different ways. You can understand that the Lord, the Lord who said that he desires that none that perish and that all should be saved, would indeed be angry with those who have essentially ushered other human beings into that eternity of death, the lost eternity. It's a serious matter. And therefore, in verse 13, he starts off by saying, they, these false teachers, will be paid back harm for the harm they have done. They have caused destruction and harm in the church. Now, I think we need a bit of a history lesson. I don't know if you like history or not, um, but um, uh, you're going to get it anyway. Um, so uh, here's a, you know, a, a brief bit of history, because I was kind of thinking about the description that was, was being laid down here at the false teachers, and I was thinking, do you know, if, I, if any of the false teachers that Peter describes walked into the church today, it would be you know, a truly apostate church that was led astray. An obviously apostate church that was led astray. That any reasonably sound bunch of Christians are never going to be deceived by, and look at the description of what he, he says here about them. He says, uh, their idea of pleasure is to carouse in broad daylight. What does he mean by that? Well, the best that I can work out from this is that it seems that they were going around with drunken, loud what we might call today loutish behavior in the middle of the day. Now, I mean, there are times when people 
I mean, I'm, I'm not talking about Christian people, I'm just talking about people in general. There are times when they have a few too many drinks uh, and get a little bit noisy. And usually, that's not during the day. I mean, even a lost, spiritually lost society recognizes that those who drink and act foolishly in the middle of the day as a result of their drink are not living to society's standards. That's even the unregenerate people see that. I mean, it's acceptable for them, for people perhaps in the evening to go out and, and drink and party and all the rest of it, but in the daytime, that's not acceptable behavior, even to this day. And that's, say, that's the unregenerate looking at that. So how much more within the church if there are people who are doing that kind of thing. But he takes it further, because look at the, the, the description, it goes on. He says they have blots and blemishes, which we'll come back to perhaps in a moment, um, in their pleasures whilst they feast with you. So this is going on while the church is meeting together and eating together and feasting together. Then he says their eyes are full of adultery, and he's not just talking metaphorically, because I wondered whether he was talking metaphorically here. Um, if you read Jude's letter, um, which we're not going to do today, I was going to, but I, I think I'll leave you to look at that. Um, but in Jude's little letter, it's only one chapter, um, and particularly from verses 3 to 16, you have a real parallel uh, to uh, 2 Peter, and particularly to 2 Peter 2. And many of the things that, that Peter mentions here are mentioned in Jude. It's, it's quite clear that the two of them... Uh, have connected in some way in their, before their writing. Now, either Peter wrote first and Jude read the letter and, and, and wrote, or, or Jude wrote first and then Peter has, has picked up on some of Jude's stuff. We don't know which way around that was. But the point is that they're both of one mind and agree that this is going on in the church. And the thing about Jude is that he's a bit more explicit. And he makes it very clear that what Peter speaks about here is eyes of adultery he says, is sexual immorality. He says it is clearly sexual activity that should not be going on in the church is going on in the church. Now, if that was going on in any reasonably minded bunch of Christians today, that would be called out instantly, wouldn't it? You wouldn't get away with it. But he goes on. Not only are their eyes full of adultery, in verse 14, and they never stop sinning, that they seduce the unstable, and they are experts in greed. And my goodness, where does it stop? And here again, this is made clear from other passages, that when he talks about experts in greed, they were literally extorting money out of people. They were extortionists. when they should not have been doing that. An accursed brood, meaning an accursed children, children who are cursed. Then he uses uh, an illustration from the Old Testament. He speaks about a false prophet called Balaam. Now you may, you may not know the story of Balaam. Um, you can go back to Numbers and read it at some point. But uh, Balaam, basically, he was a false prophet. Uh, he was um, uh, giving his false prophecies. He was taking money. He was doing all sorts of wicked things. And the Lord rebuked him. When it says that he restrained his madness, what he means is that he rebuked him for his error. And he had to use a donkey to do it in the end because Balaam wasn't going to listen in any other way. Now, the point of the illustration here is to say that these people are just as bad as this false prophet of old. Terrible people. What a picture of the false teachers. But as I say, if anybody matching that description was to walk into the church today, you'd recognize them, wouldn't you? You'd see them, wouldn't you? straight away, and you'd recognize that they're not the real deal. But let's just say, go back into history for a moment. We've got to understand a little bit about the culture in which these people lived. Remember that Peter is writing 
to specifically and predominantly to people who had lived in Rome. They may not have all been uh, actual Romans in terms of having been born and brought up in Rome. Uh, Rome was the center of the empire. So people would crowd a bit like London today. You know, we're, we're, we're blessed to have people from all over the world coming here. Rome was the same. People traveled from all over the world to live in Rome. It was the center of the universe for them. So these people may have been uh, you know, a real mix of people. But the point is that they entered into the Roman culture. And the Roman culture is built, of course, on the foundation of the Greek culture. And you've had hundreds of years now of a Greek culture which has, has, has kind of morphed into a Roman culture. And therefore, many of the Greek gods uh, exist in the Roman culture, except they have new names. So, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, Aphrodite becomes Venus, for example, the goddess of love. Well, let's just think about this goddess of love for a moment. They had temples dedicated to the goddess of Venus in Rome. What went on in the temples of the goddess of Venus? Well, it doesn't take much of an imagination to kind of work out the kind of immorality that existed. The prostitutes, the temple prostitutes that were there, the sexual activity that took place there. They were celebrating this. This is their culture. This was, this was okay for them. They were very much into that kind of thing. And there was actually a sexual liberation that existed in Roman times that didn't exist in Greek times. We often talk, don't we, about kind of the, the sexual freedom of, say, the 1960s and of how you know, it changed from earlier decades and, and became very sexually liberated uh, in the 60s, particularly in, in the West. Well, the same thing happened in the ancient world. And you can see this, actually. It's quite fascinating to, to look at uh, some of the, uh, um, the archaeology um, that, that has been dug up. And, uh, you know, when, when you actually start to look at some of the statues and things um, that they, they dig up, it's quite easy sometimes uh, to tell which were from the Greek era and which are from the Roman era. If there is any nudity of a woman in the statue, the drawing, etc., then it cannot be Greek because the Greeks had lots of nudity of men, but they thought that nudity of women was an abomination. The Romans, on the other hand, said, hey, hang on a minute, let's, let's explore this f sexual freedom a bit more. And so you get a lot of nudity of women in their statues and in their art, etc. And it's all about this freedom that they were exploring and indulging in in Roman times. But it doesn't stop there. You see, there was also another uh, god they celebrated in Rome, the Roman god called Bacchus. Now, the god Bacchus was the god of wine. And they had festivals to the god of wine. And the idea was that, well, I think you can probably guess the idea. Um, uh, you know, it, it was a little bit like, um, uh, you know, the Germans have Oktoberfest. Um, where they, they celebrate beer in Germany at this time of year. Um, uh, you know, but actually there, they took it a stage further with the wine, and they drank and they drank and they drank until they were completely out of themselves on the wine. And, and the more they could drink, the more of a celebration it was to the god Bacchus for the grapes that he had given, for the wine that he provided. This, my friends, is a completely debauched society. Because if you put the sexual freedom that they were experiencing along with the wine that was controlling them, you put the two together, you can imagine what we were ending up with. And the New Testament speaks very often, well, not very often, but from time to time it speaks even about the, the orgies that were taking place 
in society and sometimes creeping into Christian society as well. See, the thing is that Peter says that the people in the church have been brought out of this cultural revolution that was taking place and this freedom in alcohol and other forms of what we would call drugs probably today, but forms of getting high, um, substance abuse that they used as well, um, uh, that they were using those kinds of things. Um, so the sexual freedom, the alcohol, the substance abuse, the whole lot. And he says, but people have been rescued out of that and into a new way. So don't get drunk on wine. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. And he says, and just as they've come away from all of that, you've then got these false teachers who say, but this is our culture. There's nothing actually that wrong with it. It's just a bit of fun. It's good to enjoy ourselves. It's good to, to indulge in these things a little bit. And the people whose minds have been corrupted and who are trying to get straightened out through Christ are now confused and saying, well, maybe it is all right to indulge in some of that stuff again. See, the point is that although today, if some of these things was openly happening inside the church, we'd spot it a mile off. But just as Christ had saved these people from this kind of culture, this openness, this debauched revelry, carousing that they were involved in. He had saved them from that into a new life, a holy life, a life modelled on Christ. So today, he has saved you and he saved me out of a society and a culture which celebrates its sin in other ways. Some of them the same ways, actually, but in other ways too. And when we see some of the cultural things creeping back into the church, and particularly when it's coming from leaders who say, yeah, it's all right to indulge in those things, we need to be worried. We need to be very worried. Because I think that's how we apply the principles of what is going on here. You see, here Peter is concerned about the human nature. Look at verse 17. He describes these false teachers of, of how they are. These men are springs without water and mists driven along by the storm, or clouds driven along by the storm. So he says, you've got storm clouds coming, and you've got streams that when you get there, there's no water. You turn the tap on and nothing comes out. You're gasping for a drink and there is nothing, he's saying. There is nothing there. How frustrating it is if you turn the tap on and, and your glass is still empty. Here in the UK, we're immune to storm clouds. We get them all the time. But in a, a country that had blue skies for most of the time, the storm cloud could spell disaster, frankly, for them. Because sometimes when the storms came, they were pretty terrible. I remember being in Turkey a few years ago, and um, I was talking to uh, some, some other Brits at the hotel, and I said to them, uh, they, they were working uh, with the, the, it was a Christian holiday company, um, and um, uh, th th they, they'd been working out there for the season. And I remember saying to, to one young lady, I said, you know, how long have you been here? And she said, well, I came out in, uh, at, at the beginning of May. Now, by this stage, we're approaching the end of August. And I said, um, are you enjoying it? And she said, I know this is going to sound strange, but I'm missing the rain. I said, how can you possibly be missing the rain? She said, I'm just sick and tired of blue skies and 40 to 45 degrees temperature every day without fail for four months now. She said, you know, it's, uh, it's relentless. She said, it's not coming. Well, a day or two later, uh, we were sitting out on the patio 
and the same girl was there and and we were uh, I was a speaker on the holiday so we we're having a staff meeting i remember that that she was uh, in the middle of this staff meeting she suddenly got up and she pointed she said look she said there's a cloud she was so excited to see a cloud coming you know um i was just reminded of the prophet of old you know when he saw the cloud it was the size of a man's hand he said well that's what it looked like to me it was tiny but she was so excited that the cloud was coming oh maybe we're going to get some rain you know the hope of it but when the rain comes boy does it come torrential it's a downpour and they tell me that it can be quite frightening sometimes when the storms arrive and i think that's what peter's talking about here he's talking he's actually talking to people who were in the same areas i was there in turkey um, and he's saying to them you know that, that, that actually when the storms come he says it's it can be a terrible thing the low cloud it brings darkness um, if it comes really low and it brings the mists with it as well off the sea and things like that you know that that can be pretty um, awful the the pea super as we sometimes call it but going back to verse 17 blackest darkness is reserved for these people their mouths are empty boastful words uh, sorry that sorry their, their mouths uh, they mouth empty boastful words um, and are appealing to the lusts and the desires of the sinful human nature and it doesn't matter which generation we're talking about, that the desires of the lustful, sinful, human nature will always come to the surface. And it is our duty as Christians that we are always keeping that in check. We don't always succeed. Paul spoke about the fact that that he gets frustrated with himself because of the sin that keeps coming out. And he says, uh, you know, I end up doing the sin I don't want to do. And we're all a bit like that, aren't we? Sometimes, you know, we just end up doing things we don't want to do. That's part of human nature. But in Christ, we're bringing that under control. Part of the fruit of the Spirit is that of self-control. It brings us under control. That we're able to say no to the things that are displeasing and dishonoring to God. And Peter says, but these people, they have no self-control. He says, in fact, it would have been better for them if they'd never, ever known about Jesus and his salvation than to have known and then turned back. He says, there is an incredible price to pay. For misleading he says i wouldn't want to be in their shoes when they have to stand before the lord on the day of judgment how terrible it is for any of us who mislead others jesus spoke about this too he spoke about those who misled. He said, it is better to put a millstone around your neck and drop it into the middle of the ocean. Better to do that, he said, than to mislead one of these little ones, he said, as he took an illustration of a child and had him stand in front of him. The question is that are we keeping ourselves in check? Are we being so influenced by the world, the culture and the society around us that that's creeping into our lives? Are we now influencing others? A new generation perhaps. And for those of you that have influence over younger uh, children, young people, you know, that's something, a consideration for us. Whatever that influence may be, whether it's our children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, uh, children we work with, whoever that might be. But are we misleading them? Are we giving them the impression 
that actually sin is okay, that God doesn't mind, that God is a God of grace, that he forgives anyway, so what does it matter? Or do we instead take our faith seriously enough to know that it really is a matter of life and death? To know that seriously enough that we have to make sure that we are walking the straight and narrow path. That we are actually living holy lives. That we are being godly people. Are we being careful when we are out there and around in society? Lisa and I did an impromptu walk last week. We were actually going somewhere completely different and uh, it was a reasonably nice day, the sun was shining, blue skies, and Lisa said to me, um, can we stop the car and go for a walk? And there was a little place that we quite like uh, that wasn't too far away. And in a moment of madness, I said, yes, uh, we can do that. And um, uh, we got out of the car. Now, um, you see, I was actually going somewhere where I need to be reasonably dressed up. Um, wasn't quite sort of um, suit and tie, but, you know, it was, it was fairly smart casual. And now I'm going across a common and through the woods with thick mud and, you know, um, and, uh, and I'm saying to Lisa, you know, I, I didn't bring my walking shoes. Now, if we had taken my discovery, I always keep my boots in the back just in case I feel like going off road as you would with a Land Rover, wouldn't you? Um, but in the other car, I don't keep them there. So, you know, I had no choice, you know, but I just had to, so off we go. And of course, the more we started to walk, the thicker the mud was getting. And, and do you know what it's like? You get these sort of fairly narrow paths and the center is all muddy. And you see where horses and things have been down there and, and kind of, you know, really made some, 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 some nice big deep holes. Uh, with their hoofs and stuff like that, which we've got waterlogged. And, and I'm kind of edging around the bank now to try and get around these muddy patches. And then, of course, what happens then is that I'm getting tangled up in brambles and things and, you know, and getting scratched to pieces um, through all of this and then trying to jump puddles and all sorts of things. And I think, why am I, I'm not enjoying this walk. Now, I, you know, I normally do enjoy going out for a walk like that, but I'm not enjoying this walk. Why? Because I was trying to keep the dirt off of me. Do you know, that's how it's like for the Christian in society. That we are walking gingerly because we're trying to keep the dirt off of us. We're trying to stay holy. We're trying to make sure that we're not contaminated through the sin that is around us. So let me ask you the question. When you're watching TV, do you go engaging your brain, thinking, I need to just think very carefully about this. What am I taking in here? Is this good? Is this positive? Is this helping me? Or is this actually negative? Is it working against me? Is this pleasing to God? Is this dishonoring to him? For those of you that listen to music, particularly a lot of the popular culture stuff, do you ever stop to listen to some of the words? Would you really be happy affirming those words? Be careful with the music that's out there. When you go into the workplace, some of the joking that's going on, can you really laugh at the jokes? Or is it a bit coarse, something you shouldn't do? Is it honouring to God or dishonouring to him? Are you making sure that you're keeping yourself clean, spiritually speaking? Do you spend time just examining your life and just saying, do you know, I've slipped into a place where I shouldn't have gone. I've crossed a line that I shouldn't have crossed. What are you going to do about that? How are you going to prevent it from happening next time? And then the influence on those around you. 
Are you happy with the places that you go to, the company that you keep, the conversations that you have? If Jesus was standing there physically next to you, would you be embarrassed by those situations? Or would you be pleased to welcome him in? Those are the kinds of questions we need to ask. We need to ask them because all of us in some way have influence over somebody else. And in that sense, we can all be either good teachers or false teachers. We can all help to lead somebody in the way of God, or we can lead them astray. Which is it you're going to do? I'm going to just ask you to bow your heads.